Welcome to this week's episode. Man, I said that kind of fucking loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Keep it, because that's funny. So welcome to this week's episode of The Higher Self. Uh, this is Danny Morell. Sometimes you got to keep it real and not edited. Fuck yeah. um, we are ready to have an incredible conversation. I got to tell you, uh, I'm excited about this one. I, I feel like we're going to flow in some stuff. I'm, let me see, if I had a crystal ball, I'm thinking masculinity, masculine energy, relationship, probably a little bit of sex. I'm like, we're going we're gonna to go deep. So if you're ready to go deep, get ready, because I've got my friend Stephanos with us. Say hello, Stephanos. Um, pleasure to be here, man. I'm and, really happy to be here. And what's your last name? Sifandos. And how do I, how do I, how do I? Two ways, either Sifandos or Sifandos. Okay, Sifandos, that's the yeah. real way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. my buddy, uh, my buddy George from Greece, that's, yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell us a little, a little bit about yourself, because we were just saying you're, you're Greek, you're Italian. Yeah, yeah. Two places I just came back from. Yeah. And yeah. I love. Yeah. So. Is that your first time there? Yeah, man. Yeah, so it's yeah. beautiful, huh? Where'd you go, by, by the way? So I went to Athens. Yes. In Greece. Yeah. And then I, in Italy, this was favorite trip of my life thus far. Oh, wow. I landed in Rome. Mm. I rented a convertible. Mm. And I drove from Rome. I went to Tuscany. Mm. I did Portofino. Oh. I did Lake Como. So I good. did Florence. I did so everything. Good. So good. With the woman of my dream. So it was even better. And, uh, and it's kind of crazy because that trip and that vision, like being in a convertible with like light brown hair flowing, mm. like I have had that vision mm. in my mind probably since I was 15. Yeah, wow, that's interesting, isn't it? It is. I just didn't, like, I didn't know what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But I had seen it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, and you, didn't, you didn't necessarily know it was Italy though, did you? Or you did? Even in the vision back then. I, I, no, I think I, something about Italy always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it took you this time. I mean, it took you this long to get there. Huh? Well, I had to find the girl with the light brown hair. Oh, you know, of so, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's, the, that's the ingredient. That's the secret ingredient. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Well, the, all those places that you went to are beautiful. I'm from, so my mother was born in Sicily and my father was born in Greece. And they then later separately migrated to um, Australia. They met there, they had me. We then immediately moved to Greece and we spent the first few years of my life in Greece. Um, Dad just wanted to try and make it work there, but economically, the economy was very tough. You yeah. know, and Greece is very tough. So uh, we went back to Australia uh, and I grew up there, you know, with my Italian grandparents, my mother's parents. Um, and we would go back and forth to Greece whenever we could because we had family there. We were very close with family, but yeah, largely grew up in Greece and. Yeah, well, that was that was interesting. That was tough because I felt very displaced. Like I felt like my home was in Greece, but I felt like my home was in Australia, and I was never settled in either way, in e either one of those. And now I live in the US, and I feel pretty settled actually. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I definitely, I definitely miss Greece and Italy as well, both as a, as a and as a home. You know, I have multiple homes, and I'm honestly, I miss Australia as well. It's a beautiful place. Have you been to Australia? I haven't yet. You Yet, you, I think you'll. I think you'll enjoy it. But you know, I gotta ask you, and let's yeah. just like kind of hop into it. Yeah, yeah. Number one, I want to know what did that feel like when you were a little boy growing yeah. up, feeling this yeah. place? Because I felt that growing up in New York City, mm. and like my roots are Latin American, mm. and so I felt like I'm missing something: the music, yeah. the food, the everything. But yeah. but number two, you know, with what just happened, all the craziness. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Australia got hit pretty hard with that. Politically, they got hit Politically, hard. Politically, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm, what, what, I'm pretty vocal on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What did that feel like? Cause it, it felt horrible, man. It felt, I felt very angry. I had a lot of rage move through me. I felt deeply sad. Um, and, you know, to, to respond to your earlier question around feeling displaced, I felt very alone and isolated. I felt very, very alone, man. Like I didn't belong anywhere. That coupled with the way my family unit and dynamic was, which was very volatile and violent, I, I just felt very scared most of the time as a kid growing up, you know? And like I didn't have anyone or anywhere that, that I belonged. Like when I wasn't in Greece, I missed my uncle. He was like, my, that was my father's brother. He was, I was so close to him. He was, I saw him as more of a father at some, at, at, at most, at most of the time, right? And so I missed him dearly. And then when we were there, I missed my grandparents, my Italian grandparents, my mother's parents. And so it was just, it was just very difficult from, from that perspective. And then the other side of that was I felt very blessed that I had so many people that loved me as well, you know? However, and my mum, my mum and dad loved me deeply and I felt that, but I also felt a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, pain from them as well right so 
that part was tough. And most recently, in the last couple of years, you know, I haven't even seen my niece yet. That was, my brother um, just had a child, well, just two and a half years ago. Mm. I haven't been able to see her because of you know, everything. I mean, every, circumstances, yes. And then, and then you know, life happens. I'm going to try and bring him out this year, though, for Christmas, which is going to be great. I'm very excited about that. But yeah, Australia got hit very hard in terms of how the the country, I guess, as an organisation, as a political organisation, dealt with. Um, travelers coming in and out of the country is very restricted. Um, you know, some would say excessively restricted. I believe excessively restricted. Um, and I think it caused more harm than good. And we won't really see that for another few years, but we'll also see what happens. Yeah. 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 You know, as, as you were speaking, I felt this like energy. Mm. And um, what I love about you Right, even though we don't know each other that well, maybe it'll come up. But we spent, you know, four intense days together recently, and I love that when I when I'm with you, I feel both this strong masculine energy and presence, and yet I also feel this like softness and care, and you know, I I, I felt that sadness a little bit, that little boy a little bit. I also I've seen you show pictures of the baby and like how excited you get about that. And that is something that is rare mm. in today's man. It mm. is rare to to be able to, you know, have so much bandwidth and to be able to to be able to flex both sides of you and be connected with both sides of you. And yet I caught something. I also caught that you said, you know, I saw my uncle as my real father figure. So there's got to be a wound there. Right. There's got to be a wound there. And for our listeners, what maybe some of them might not realize is sometimes the wound is the greatest gift. You know what I mean? hundred percent. What comes up when I share that? For yeah. You? So very accurate. And thank you for, you know, your reflection there as well. And it's something that I'm very proactive with is to, because I believe in range. I believe in bandwidth. I believe in, you know, working the entire spectrum. I think that's part of our human experience. Right. And so, you, you know, that, uh, even now, I still and, – and, and I have done so much deep work with, with my father and he's, he's still alive and he lives in Greece and I, and I miss him dearly. We haven't seen each other for again for a couple of years um, since the pandemic but I still feel that closeness with my uncle, that relatability, right, like where he, he sees me and he gets me and there's a deeper level of empathy and compassion. And look, part of that is also because he – probably because he wasn't my father. Right, and then that's a that's a loaded statement. And what I mean by that is, he maybe didn't have that level of responsibility. He wasn't in my father's mind. He wasn't in my father's body. And so the way that he could love me was maybe very different. The way that he showed affection was very different. He's also a very different person. So when I look at what I I am very grateful for the father that I had because of what I learned from that. Now, go back ten years ago, I wouldn't probably say that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like we have to move through our pain, we have to move through our recon internal reconciliation, we have to move through our own reckoning, we have to face the entirety of ourselves before we can come to a place of, oh, I see the value in this, or I see the lesson in this, or I see the, the wisdom and the teaching in this. Like, we have to be able to feel before we can reframe, essentially, right? And so part of my journey with respect to my father and my mother and my family dynamic and the trauma that I experienced there was really feeling and releasing what was unfelt because as a kid what happened for me was I was very I experienced paralysis emotional paralysis which means I was too scared I mean I was wetting the bed until probably eight or nine years old because I was scared yeah wow. just scared of my like it was always shouting and yelling and violence and all of that hiding under the bed wetting my bed and then I'd, I'd be even scared like, I'll wet the bed I'm gonna get in trouble for wetting the bed yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. so so it was it, it felt never-ending and, and it felt very, very intense. And so I had to, as a kid, I suppressed and repressed a lot of what I really wanted to express, which was, and I remember once or twice doing this, but, you know, yelling at my parents to tell them to stop fighting or, you know, um, putting a boundary up and saying, no, stop hitting me or whatever it may be, right? And so as an adult, that stuff's still in our nervous system. And so to close the loop on that trauma, we have to be able to feel and express those big, big things and move that big energy in safe environments and safe places. And that takes time. You can't, you can't do that fast because trauma is too much too soon, too fast. You can't heal in the same way, which is a big mistake that 
I think Western culture makes, and then particularly Western culture that layers their ideology and their philosophy over Eastern culture. An example of that, and not just Eastern culture or even indigenous culture, and, and an, an example of that is plant medicine, mm-hmm. right? And like, the, and how we how we move with plant medicine, and there needs to be space and integration. There needs to be a softness. There needs to be a pausing there needs to be a rest in between the peak experiences and now that that changes for every individual and it's different but the person that's addicted to the experience or the thing or the substance that's going to take their pain away that's not what all that stuff's intended for and so we can't heal in the same way that trauma happens uh, with us to us for us right so it's been a journey of years really like understanding that because I'm also a high achiever and a high performer. So (laughs) if I put my mind to something, I want it to happen straight away. Now. Now, yesterday. (laughs) So, so, (laughs) so I've had to learn to, to not do that and not be that person. Yeah. So much came up for me while you were sharing that. Um, you know, specifically like, like for me, I find myself, you know, also, you know, being that high achiever and yet also wanting to share with the world my experiences. Mm. So I remember when I first came out of, you know, my first ayahuasca ceremonies, I came out like a bat out of hell, man. I was telling everybody and they specifically said, okay, whatever you do, don't tell everybody because everybody has their own timing, you know? And I did the opposite because I just couldn't contain myself. You know, I wasn't, at that time, my root chakra wasn't open yet. I didn't know this just yet. So I was like, there was no groundedness. There was no like, chill out, man. Just just kind of like let everybody take its course. And today I heard something. It was literally today, it it was Ram Das and it was an old video of him. He says, you know, he says, everything has its timing and the heart has to come first. You know, the heart has to open first before the mind follows. And sometimes what we try to do is we try to push our healing onto people. And and I know for a fact, I did this at the very beginning. And when that happens, it's like mind speaking to mind and mind like starts to debate and protect. And therefore it doesn't even allow the process to fully happen. You know, the heart has to open up and and, and the second thing that I thought as you were saying was forgi- forgiveness has to take place as well. You know, um, I remember the moment where I was literally on stage and I was hosting an event and it hit me hard. It said, you know what? You're never going to be your fullest potential or help others do the same if you can't forgive your father. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I, I don't want to deal with this right now. Yeah, because but- you know it's not just our... Oh, Okay, you're forgiven. You know the process no, involved. No, right. Because, okay, I forgive you is up here. In here, get ready. Yeah, it's get a different ready. game, right? It's, it's a different game, yeah. man. It's a different game. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think, and, 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 and man, I've experienced the same thing. And that's just us on our, the, at, at the beginning stages of our healing journey. You can call it premature or immature, and, and not in a negative way. Like, no, there's no negative connotation associated with immature in this in this context. It's more just we're at the beginning stages of our healing journey. And the thing that you did, everyone does. Like, I want to scream it from the rooftops. Of course, a new profound experience. And the more you have those experiences, the more you realize, oh, it's not necessarily about that. It doesn't need to be that. That's right. And you, re- and you embody the, the, oh, the, the timing piece. Like you really get it. That's, yeah. And that's just part of the journey. We have to, I think being hard on ourselves, I'm not saying that you were, but I think being hard on ourselves only actually pulls us away from dropping deeper into maturity. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. And, and speaking of that, you know, I think that maturity and that word leads us into masculinity because I know that's something that you are, it, it's what you do. Like, I, I don't know that anybody does it as good as you do. Like, I love Thanks, seeing man. your videos and everything that you do. Um, uh, t- to you, what does the awakened or a spiritual or an enlightened or what does masculinity mean, yeah. you know, for a man that wants to be balanced both the mind, the heart, the masculine, the feminine, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways that I would respond to that. The first is, you know, the, the enlightened, awakened, mature masculine, conscious masculine, you know, whatever words we want to put around that. I don't think that exists without that individual fully exploring all facets of themselves. That means they have to touch their darkness. They have to touch their shadow. They have to be familiar with their shadows. They have to be familiar with their pains and their fears. They have to not negate them, suppress them, repress them, numb them, run away from them, avoid them. 
um, because that only then creates a partial human being, a partial experience for others, and a partial internal experience. Because what we're saying is we're only going to be attracted to what's convenient, which essentially makes us lazy, uh, which I don't think is a, is a virtue for any, any man or any healthy masculine individual. Uh, it pulls us away from courage. It pulls us away from wholeness or a sense of wholeness and it leads us to believe that we're fractured even if it's unconscious because we're literally denying aspects of ourselves that exist within us, whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, whether it's grief or loss or jealousy or whatever it may be, right? And so we have to to be... I believe to be fully enlightened or awakened and whatever, however we define them, that's a, that's a big thing to define. But a big part of that is we have to touch all aspects of ourselves. That's the range piece, right? So that's the first way that I would, I would look at that and say, if you can't touch the inconvenient parts of you, if you can't be in deeper communion with the inconvenient, uncomfortable parts of you, the, the parts that you don't like, the parts that society shuns, then you're going to struggle to feel whole within yourself. And the other way that I would respond to that in terms of a framework, and I really, I pull from Jack Donovan's work, uh, was he's the first person that I had seen that, that I had read this from. And, and that is looking at what it means to be good at being a man. And that begins to define our masculinity because masculinity isn't just a cultural construct. It is also a biological construct at some level, right? And so we can't, we can't throw that away, especially in the times that we live in where we want to subjectify or maybe that's the correct term but but place a subjective nature of reality on everything and i'm not saying it's an objective reality <clears throat> but what i am saying is that if we can follow these principles of how we've evolved from an evolutionary perspective how we've evolved and grown in tribes and in relation to each other as men that impacts and influences masculinity because there's so many layers to that i think this is a really good start and so he looks at these um, four tactical virtues, and I've added one to that. And so it's mastery, courage, strength, and I've added um, I've added uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, sorry, mastery, courage, strength. Oh shit! Um, Vulnerability. No. Mm -hmm. um, fuck. <laughs> I've literally got a head block, a uh, head blank. Um, It'll come. Yeah. Anyway, there's four tactical virtues. I've added connectivity, um, and it would it would definitely come to me. So there's there's these these Virtues, if you like, if we are able to master them, and I'll, and I'll explain a couple right now, it, it helps us see a fuller side of ourselves. So for example, courage, right? As a man, and you think about this hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, even as hominoids, as men, we went into the world and we were explorers, great explorers of the world, of the outer world, right? And we, we look at that and we think what was required to be that man and what did we cultivate and develop as a result of that? We required courage. We required initiation, right? To be able to go out into the world, extend the perimeter, keep our family safe. This led to cultural practices, right? But we were maybe assigned those roles because we were the, the bigger human, right? We were the stronger human. It doesn't make us better or worse. And this has nothing to do with, with good or bad. These are not judgment values, but these are the roles that we assumed. And so when we look at modernity today, where does man have courage in modernity today? I th outside of maybe- It's the, very limited. It's very limited, right? Unless you're in the military, unless you're um, actively pursuing with tenacity big dreams or any dreams for that matter, right? So you have your own business or you're, you're an athlete or whatever it may be, or you're really committed to your cause. So many people, you ask, you ask 10 men, I've got a question for you, ask 10 men, do you enjoy what you do in the world? Like, are you connected to how you spend your day, like your work or your vocation? How many do you think would say, fuck yeah, out of those 10? I know, maybe one, if any. So where's the courage? Zero. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So courage isn't just, I'm gonna fight a big bear or a big beast. It's not about that. Like we've, got to, we've got to translate it to our modern times as well, like what, what elicits physiolo physiologically within us and psychologically as well. When we look at mastery, we had to literally do so much with our hands to survive, make tools, create shelters, and we, those gifts that we had, if we were good at making weapons, we would then contribute that to the tribe. Again, in, in, in the modern day of convenience, how active, again, don't think of the circle of people that you mix with, 
Right. Generally speaking, Genuinely, how right. active are people, are men with their hands? Not at all. How, what are they learning new things? Right. They're monotonous. Um, I mean, it, j- just to just stop yeah. you for a moment, yeah. you know, number one, when you mentioned the courage piece, because even that, I mean, you know, when I start a new business, right? Yeah, it's courageous, you know, and yet that is nothing like getting in a boat and going into uncharted territory to discover new land. I mean, that is like, that's a whole nother level. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The only courage that I've ever felt like that was, you know, when I'm deep in ceremony and I have to deal with forgiveness that. or I have to deal with, you know, I haven't grieved my mother's death or I have to deal with the fact that my father wasn't there for me. That, that, that is like deep courage because that's the shit I didn't want to, I didn't want to face it. And you know, and I'm going to bring something up. The, 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 the biggest courage I ever had to embody was just happened recently, and I, I'm sure you're going to get a kick out of this, where, where for the first time, do you remember when we were at um, the weekend, which we'll have to bring it up, where we had that activity, we were looking at each other, and we said, what do you want? Mm. What do you want? And everybody yep. was like, bullshit, bullshit. Mm. And all the men were trying, you know what I finally figured it out? I'm here, and, uh, and I'm you know making love to my woman, and... Um, you know, in the past, I would always grab a woman's arms and like put them around me, mm. you know? And then somehow they'd like fall off. And then like, I'd like put them around me again, you know? And it was just something that I did. Yeah. And yet, I, I can say this, I had never been with a woman that caused me to feel such connection like I am now. Mm. And probably that was because and that's not anything to say about the women. That was all me mm. because I was disconnected with myself, mm. you know. So through the journey, I'm finally connected with myself that this recently just happened. This was a week or two ago. And um, I finally felt a woman's arms around me. And in that moment, it was like I just started releasing so many tears mm. because I figured it out. I go, oh, my God, I know what I've wanted my whole life. It was to just be held. My entire life, that's what I wanted. That's what I was looking for, right? And then more unraveled. Oh my God, I know where it came from. It was the fact that my mother was never held because my mother's mother died when she was 13 years old. Mm. And then it went a little bit deeper. And now I'm full on like... I'm just bawling my eyeball, but my eyeballs out. I'm I'm in bed. She's trying to help me. I I I I don't want her to help me because this is very vulnerable for me now. Because mm. this is literally my life story. And then I go, oh my god, my poor mom lived her entire life with this and never got to heal this. Mm. And then it was, oh my god, like literally my mom died in my arms, and I'm just bawling. And in that moment, I I couldn't handle it on my own. I had to have the courage to let someone hold me through it. And I think that was probably the most courageous thing that I've ever had to do because it's literally facing your deepest life story, like in that moment, you know? And and I think you're touching on something really important here and what you're touching on, firstly, that's deeply vulnerable and very powerful. And that's a gift that you're able to bring yourself to a place in your life where you have created the circumstances to actually be able to access that that level of depth, right? So take take as many moments as you need to for the rest of your life to acknowledge that. That's very fucking powerful. Yeah. And we, I'm not saying that the, the final frontier, I'll say this very clearly, the final frontier for us as humans and for in this context men is our inner sanctum, our in our consciousness, our inner selves. We I'm not saying that we've explored the entirety of the outer world of, of this earth or space. Our, I mean, the, the the infinite nature of our cosmos is ridiculous. You can't even we can't even fathom it no. mathematically. Our brains won't even comprehend it. So no. there's lots to explore outside. But we have created enough physical safety in our environment. The majority of us have on this planet where really the final frontier is internal now. And so that's where we have to apply the, the mastery, the courage, the strength, and, and still strength, physical strength is important for men as well. As, a, as <clears throat> excuse me, as one of those tactical virtues, as is connectivity, I believe one of the ways that we've evolved 
as human beings is yes, it's the advent of language. It's potentially the discovery of medicinal plants, um, you know, psychedelic plants. It's e eating meat, it's brain development, prefrontal cortex development, whatever it may be, like all these things that have brought us together. But one of the biggest things that have brought us together is the way that we've related to each other socially over the, over mi millions of years. And that has brought us to where we are today. And that has raised our level of understanding and awareness of each other and self. And so we we need to we need to be courageous. We need to not only find outer strength but inner strength to begin to really go deeper into these unknown territories within our own mindscape. And I, I think that if we do that more and more, and it's not even a volume game, but if we do that with with a, a sense of deliberateness, like intention, mm. right? We we will the, the trickle effect of that will help evolve our our greater humanity into what I'm not sure and that's but that's the fun thing that's yeah. the exciting thing it's like the unknown right but the, but placing ourselves in that position of exploration is what is going to empower individual and humanity as a collective yeah and and you know Stefanos correct me if I'm wrong but I, it's what everybody is avoiding I, I agree it's, yeah it's, I very much a, agree with like, that you know what I'm saying yeah and I I, I remember. I remember this has been a process for me, but I remember when I I couldn't have gotten there if I first didn't get to a space where I allowed love to enter my heart. Yeah. And I literally remember I was at a I was at a Joe Dispenser retreat actually. And he said some words. I was in deep meditation and we were sending love to these um uh, these sick individuals. Um and as we did that, he says, um, he says, and the love you share is the love you, uh, the love you give is the love you receive. And I can picture this, I'm in deep meditation and like all week I had helped all of these different women at the retreat, you know, just consoled them, spoke to them, you know, held them, whatever the case may be. So it's like six or seven different women that were in my journey and in my meditation, all of a sudden I'm seeing like the seven of them, they're in front of me and their love starts coming to me, to like my heart. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I don't want to feel this. No, no, no. I don't. Like literally I was saying, I don't want love. Like I'm okay giving it, but I don't want it, you know? And it was because I was uncomfortable receiving it because my mom maternally didn't know how to offer it because she never had it herself. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really profound when, 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 when you get at Very, it. Very, yeah. yeah. The interesting thing is, is that if we don't place ourselves in uncomfortable situations or unknown situations where we can actually explore these parts of ourselves, we remain on repeat for all of our lives. That's it, man. Yet there's something that feels like it's missing within us. And so what do we do to fill the void? What's familiar, like drugs, alcohol, alcohol. TV, whatever, sex, porn, food, whatever. porn, whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Like whatever's convenient, whatever's a peak experience, the greater the pain, the greater the pleasure required to avoid and numb that pain. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So could you give me an example, right? Could you give me an example of how you went in, right? How you went into the darkness to that shadow, which by the way, many of our listeners, maybe they are, they're new to this world and they don't even understand what a shadow is. Could you give me an example of how you went in and dealt with your shadow? Yeah, so the, the shadow in the simplest form is the unwanted or inconvenient, undesirable, quote-unquote ugly parts of ourselves that we can't really touch or can't be in communion with or we can't really hold within our personality. It's the aspects of our personality that we deem to be not valuable or that we think someone else may think think something negatively of us, right? And so we, we hide it. Think of, a, think of uh, maybe behaving jealous and you think, oh, if I'm jealous, then the, my friends aren't going to like me. Let me just take that and put it in my backpack. Right? And then we have an accumulation of all these shadow elements of self in this very heavy backpack that we carry around with us unconsciously. And so what we try and do as people is we wear masks to compensate for these unfavorable aspects of ourselves, that gets very tiring. And it also causes a disruption within our own, the own fabric of our psyche. And so now I'm actually not being me, I'm being what I think you want me to be. Mm -hmm. That's very tiring and yeah. it's very, very heavy. And we all do this, right? So that's in short, that's the shadow, right? Got it. So for me, I, I went, <laughs> I, I did what I, I said don't do. Um, and that's why I can say it, I guess. I went very deep, very quick. And so I had, a, I had an experience 
which was I, I broke up with my partner, but in the way that we broke up, she found out that I was cheating on her. This was many years ago. And as that unraveled, it wasn't just um, a one-off situation or something very simple. It was very complex and acute. It was uh, potentially hundreds of times cheating in a, in a four-and-a-half-year period that we were together. You? Yes, me. Got Prostitution. Um, oh, just, you know, one night stands, emotional affairs, whatever it was. It was everything and anything you could pretty much think of. And I'd been doing that really for most of my life. And I just ignored it. I just thought that's what men do. And when I came face to face with her pain, it evoked a great deal of shame in me. And as a result of that, shame that I'd been suppressing for a very long time around my own sense of self, right? Uh, around who I was in the world, around how I thought my father saw me as well. And just pain that I'd been repressing from, a childhood, from my childhood all came to the surface. And I didn't know what to do with it. And it was very overwhelming to the point where I wanted to kill myself. Not for, that wasn't the first time I had suicidal ideation, but it was very strong. And I thought to myself in those moments, I can't go back to what I was this is not right. Not from a moral place, just from a, this is way out of alignment and morally as well. But primarily this just isn't me. And so I sat with myself. I literally sat with myself. I sat down. I deliberately sat down. I said, what do I do? I either ignore this and I go about my life and I have a feeling that I'm going to live a very empty, unsuccessful life. A life where I'm on this hamster wheel attempting to be successful externally never really get there, but also have that consistently define me as a man and as a, as a person of value. I go deep into this stuff and I explore. I don't know exactly how, but I've got some ideas and I can start. And then here are the three options of that exploration. I either end up in a mental asylum, so I'm already feeling crazy, right? <clears throat> I commit suicide or I get through this and... I live the life that I know I'm capable of and perhaps I am able to support others in their journey. But I know I've got to go to some really, really dark, painful places. Now, part of that was my personality in being extreme and so being attracted to difficult things, defining me. And part of it was an inner knowing that I knew I had to go down this path no matter what. Yeah. So that's what I did. And it was very painful and very dark and I, I did seek help. I had counselors and psychologists and therapists and shamans and spiritual healers and energy workers. And there was a lot of it that I did by myself. I spent years in this space. I went into massive debt, uh, you know, multiple six figure debt because I had to live on credit card. I stopped working. I gave away my businesses. Oh, like, so you went, I fucking like went all, all in. in. I went all in. And I wow. could, but I didn't have kids. I wasn't married. Yeah, I, yeah. I was very lucky that I had my grandparents' home that I could live in. But there were times when I wasn't eating which was convenient because I was doing a lot of fasting at that point. I just didn't have money for food. I remember my friend would and, and, and come and knock on my door. He said, get in the car, I'm taking you to get food. So I know you can't afford it right now. Hmm. I don't forget things that people do for me. I remember them very clearly. And <clears throat> in times of, of, you know, deep pain and, and, and solitude and also loneliness because that was just part of the journey. There were people in my life, I was very blessed that I'd cultivated very uh, profound friendships, uh, that the people in my life were there for me, you know, <laughs> including my mother who lent me a lot of money at that time to work with a coach, which really, she really became a catalyst for even deeper transformation. And, you know, fast track very briefly, within a very short period of time, I was able to pay back all my unhealthy debts and being surplus now, you know, um, and that's because of the work. And I, I'll say, I'll say this very clearly, and this has been my experience, and it is the experience of when I see others as well. And I think you could probably vouch for this: the deeper inner work that we do, the more inner work that we do, the more out of success we have. Fuck, it's just really that simple. If, if <laughs> it really is that simple, it isn't really, it? but it's really challenging to do really that. It really is because it's scary. So fucking scary, man. So scary, man. Yeah. I went to places, brother, that I don't think any human being should go to. Oh, bro, I've been there. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. I um, I can relate so much yeah. with everything you said. I remember 
you know, I've shared this, but I haven't shared it too much. I, I went six months where I think I slept three nights. Oof. Yeah, it's heavy, man. Because I, because I, mine was the fear of death. Yeah, you know, and I yeah. thought everything you thought, and I was going crazy. Yeah, yeah, I was going crazy. I was looking in the mirror and seeing demons, and I didn't know what I was saying. Yeah, at man. some point. Yeah. yeah, I remember laying on that couch in the middle of the day, and by the way, you know while still running the business, mm. while still getting up and like trying to lead a call and, and doing what I could do, but y y you know if, but the payoff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. The payoff, it's like yeah. I try to tell everybody, it's you don't understand like issues with your health, because that's the other thing, is like when you were saying, you know, we put that stuff in the backpack, that backpack weighs heavy oh. on your energetic field. Everything. Well, how do you think we get sick? Yeah. How do you think we get sick? Big time. I, I mean, I used to be so afraid of getting sick. Like, that doesn't even, I'm not getting sick. You know what I'm saying? It's because the body, the body just responds to what's happening inside. Yeah. You know? Um, and I try to tell everybody this. It's like the outside world is just a reflection of what's going on in the inside world. So if you're having problems with, you know, I call it the three energies of mastery, which is money, food, and sex. Mm. If you're having problems with money, understand that there's no shortage of money. You know what I mean? And there's no one stopping you. I know what your mom told you. I know what your dad told you. But there's absolutely no one stopping you mm. other than the story and the construct and the paradigm that you're living in about money. Yeah. And the fact is, is that you don't attract money because it feels safe to stay in that construct. Yep. And until you go deep into that construct and, 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 and forgive whoever you have to forgive, Maybe you have to forgive the white man because for us as Hispanics, it's the white man. He's stopping. No, I, I've never met this this white man that's supposedly stopping me from like mm. being successful. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's the government. Maybe it's the president. Maybe it's your father. Maybe whoever. But until you have the courage to go in there, right? It'll always be the same. And the minute that you do, you start. I know you know this from the work you do. Is like I see some of our clients like literally. Oh my God, I literally attracted a hundred thousand dollars. And it came out of nowhere and whatever yeah. the case may be. And like, oh my God, I'm now debt free. And it's like their whole world changes. And it's the same thing with the body. Those extra 10 pounds that you've been trying to lose forever. And it's the same thing with relationships, you know? And I want to go into that now because, mm. you know, it's interesting. It's like, you know, I admire and respect you so much, you know? And there's not very many humans that I could say that about. And I just from afar, like I know, and, and now this is even resonating with me more because I can relate to the work you've done. Mm -hmm. And I admire and respect you for the values that you uphold as a man and as a man with a woman, you know? And I know it's not talk, because when I hear you, I feel it. I, I feel it here. And so then for you to just say everything that you just said, when you said, you know, that you cheated multiple, it was, motherfucker like that's a big journey right and so for the guy out there who's struggling with this right for the guy out there who maybe thinks that cheating is is normal right what are some steps that they can take to get to a healthy space where they're able to open up their heart and truly be in a loving relationship with a woman let's start there yeah so the important thing is that men surround themselves with healthy men, other healthy men, men that can reflect back to them very honestly. Hey man, is that the best use of your time? Hey, the choice that you made with your partner with respect to that story you just told me and how you treated her, do you think that was the most appropriate thing? Like Men that are gonna challenge you and call you forward without judgment, without harsh critique. They'll be firm, they'll challenge you, but they're gonna show you something that you can't see. Because when we're able to do that, that's when our hearts actually open in the presence of familiarity. Like as a human being, I see you, I see you in many la labels and layers. I see you as a man. I see you as a human being. I see you for the culture that you are. I see you for the beard that you have, for the, the pants that you have on the shirt. Like there's always these, these different rec recognition points, right? Yeah, yeah. As a man, most men have never really, most, not all, but most men have never really felt seen by their fathers have never really been seen by other men in their lives, in their, in their childhood developmentally, right? As they're moving from boyhood to adulthood. They haven't been witnessed and they haven't been given 
clean and clear direction. They haven't been taken through healthy rites of passage. They haven't been greeted and meted by other healthy men at the end of that rite of passage saying, you are now a man and I will support you in continuing to be a healthy man. Like that doesn't, where does that happen in our society? Very seldom, very seldom. So we need other men to reflect back to us so that we can feel comfortable and safe, emotionally safe, and open to start sharing the parts of us that we've shut down. When we can do that in the presence of other men, we can then do that in the presence of women. Mm. Because it's such a threat, it's a threat for, 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 to be in the presence of men and women, but particularly women in this sense, because there's this layer of romance, sexuality, intimacy, that, that's really quite deep. And so we armor up, we shut down, and we will not share ourselves with women. So the practice of being able to share micro aspects of self with other men, you know, slowly into that, can be deeply, deeply beneficial for men in terms of then opening up to, to women. Right. Uh, that's, that, that, is, that is honestly a direct path. Now, other things, of course, like be, be proactive with your health and wellness. Like if you want to learn to get stronger or bigger or lose weight or become more defined, you're going to do research. You're going to jump on the internet. You're going to read books. You might go to a dietitian, nutritionist, or um, you may get some labs. You may work with a longevity doctor, whatever, right? You, you're going to work with people. Do the same with your mind. Like if you know, you look back, you're 40 years old and you look back at your life and you have this trail of broken relationships. Well, guess what? You're the fucking common denominator. <laughs> like they may all be different women, but really they're the same archetype of person just with a different haircut and a different face. That's right. And a different energetic signature. But essentially you're attracting the same paradigms into your life. So maybe think, well, is it my mind? Is it my beliefs? Is it my emotional insecurities? Well, maybe I'll work with someone that could support me in understanding that. It's fucking There's really not that hard. There's, There's a, a thought. Like, yeah, yeah. I want to build a house. I can't build a house, but I can do brickwork, but I can't do Well, maybe I'll get a plumber and an electrician. And a re- like, I'm going to bring the people into my life to help me with the things that I want to create. Yeah. But we live in a, in, a, in a world where we diffuse ourselves of responsibility. So it, was, it can't be me. It has to be the other 10 women that I've dated that are all different, that are separate. To, it must be them. Yeah. 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 I love that. Because that makes you a victim. Yeah, and we love to play the victim. Not the creator. Yeah, because if we play the victim, and not everyone likes to play the victim, but if we play the victim, we firstly need a villain, and the ego loves that because we don't have to look within now. Blame. Yeah, blame and shame. And then we need a hero. That's right. And conveniently, we can't be our own hero because that requires too much work. Too much responsibility. We can can outsource (laughs) that as well. Isn't it beautiful? Like when you get it, it's, it's friggin' awesome. Oh man. Yeah. We're funny creatures. Man. We really are. We really are. So, so I, I, I want to be, you know, a little vulnerable here, but now I want to talk about relationship in and of itself. You know, one of the things that I noticed in this new relationship is that I have learned to, I have had to learn to change what I think a relationship is mm. because what I thought a relationship was, was as a result of my previous paradigm. Mm. Do they accept me? Do they not accept me? Can I speak my truth? Can I not speak my truth? If I speak my truth, will they be upset at me? If they're upset at me, does that mean we're gonna be fighting for three weeks? Does mm. it, it's just, you know, so much of insecurity is what it was, mm. that when you remove all that insecurity, right, and you're able to be honest with yourself and your truth, it literally shifts the relationship because all mm. the drama is gone, mm. right? And when the drama is gone, you get to the space where you're like, well, fuck, what's left? Mm. And then what's left is like love, mm. passion, friendship, having fun, traveling. Like these are all things that, I mean, Stefanos, you know, I was married for 13 years mm. and it, you know, it wasn't her, it was me. It was me that, didn't want to go have fun. It was me that didn't want to go travel. It was me that was afraid to speak my truth. And of course, if she sensed me not wanting to speak my truth, she was going to react in her masculine and keep me in that. It was me. I was the creator, you know? And now that I've done all the work, you get to the space in the relationship where you're like, wait a minute, all these things that I'm used to feeling and thinking are now gone. And there's a little moment where it gets a little scary because mm. it's, like, it's like the death of what you thought a relationship was. 
and the birth of what a true relationship is with another woman. And that's my question for you is what is a healthy relationship with a woman as a man look like, feel like? I know it's different for everybody, but mm. what have you experienced? Mm. And you're right. It is, it is a little different for everybody. And there are, there are some basic principles that we can live by that help us transition in the relationship, grow in the relationship, and really make a decision of whether this relationship is in the greatest alignment for both of us. So I look at I look at the term sacred union or conscious relationship, and I, I see it in in various layers. The first is, you know, the questions that we we can ask in the relationship are: Does my partner make me a better person? It's just use simple terms, right? Just better person, right? Do I make them a better person? Do we make each other better people? And do us as a couple make greater impact in the world around us, right? That's and can I be honest with those answers? Yeah. Because for a while I would ask that, yeah, of course she does. Yeah. Or yeah, of course I do. Yeah. Or yeah, of course we do. Yeah. But, but yeah. Yeah, that, and that's the thing, right? Like being, being honest with you, again, like if we're honest with each other, and this is a great, this is a powerful principle of any intimate relating is, is honesty, right? In yeah. any relationship, friendship, colleague, business relationship, romantic partnership, you, with your children, like honesty is very important in terms of, Contextually, how we feel, what we're experiencing, what our desires are, what our preferences are in relationship. When someone in the relationship does something or acts a particular way that activates something with us is taking initially responsibility to go within and say, well, yes, she's behaved this way and I've responded or reacted this way. Let me, let me check in with that first. Let me th let that be the first port of call, as opposed to, "Hey, you did something and it hurt me. Don't do it again." And then communicate from a non-judgmental way, like NVC or Imago Dialogue, are great tools for communication. Just two simple yet very powerful tools for communication, in, in, which involve active listening, which involve non-judgmental language, which involved curiosity. That's a big thing with with relationships is curiosity, mm. right? You've got to be curious. This is this is a, this is a lead off off the. Let me go within first. Let me get curious about what's happening here. Like she said, she's going out and she's going with the uh, she's spending the weekend with the girlfriends and it's making me jealous or upset well, well that jealousy is mine that sadness is mine like, what, what's going on here well, that, let me let me let me check in with that no, don't let me just project that on her no you can't go no, okay i want to control where do i want to control where was i not where was i controlled in my life where do i lose control where do i give my power away we have to be reflective beings i think as a society we're getting um more ignorant, actually. Mm. You know, I, I look. I look back at at many ancient texts, whether it's ancient Greeks, Sumerians, the Vedics, the Egyptians, uh, different South American cultures. There's there's this cross cultural idea that as human beings, we have to make the time to explore ourselves. At the end of every day, spend a few minutes reflecting on who you were that day. Like, who does that? I don't think we do that enough in our society. We will get home and we'll watch Netflix. Right. Or, or Prime or whatever, or Hulu, whatever the fuck it is. Right. right. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with watching TV. It's just where, what's the come from? And so an intimate relationship, you know, making time for each other, making time for the relationship, just like you make time for the business that you work in or make time for your children or make time for the hobbies that you play. I mean, you've got a guitar there. I don't know if you play guitar, but you, know, mm. you make time for that. Hopefully you do. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, we have to make time for the relationship. So... The foundations are really important. I always say if you're getting into a relationship, firstly, be single for as long as you can. Know yourself. Yeah, that's that, right. You, that's constantly evolving practice. And th when you move into intimate relationship, you actually know parts of yourself that you would never know otherwise, right? So I'm not saying don't ever be in an intimate relationship, but be single. And that's not saying, oh, enjoy yourself because when you're in a relationship, you don't. No, just learn to be with yourself. Otherwise, you'll project your insecurities and your low self-worth on. Oh, the other. That's right. That's right. So when you get together, ask each other potent, meaningful questions around sexuality, around their upbringing. Share, lead. As a man, lead. Be proactive. And yes, I want to know this about you and let me share this about me so first. So important. So important. Don't just fucking ask and then not give what your response is. Like really, 
Learn their deepest fears. Learn what their dreams and aspirations are. Learn how they want to do family and life. Learn what their highest values are. Learn what they enjoy doing. Understand who their friends are. Like really get to know the person. Yes, get to know them physically as well, of course, and sexually. That's very important. And there's more to the human being. We're multi-layered beings, especially if we're going to choose to live together or intertwine our lives together in some capacity. Hmm. So knowing who that person is and knowing who you are in relation to that pro in, in relation to that person, who you become in relation to that person is an ongoing process, but we have to start somewhere. So laying those foundations, asking those questions, they're just some questions. Of course, I've got hundreds of questions that you, you can ask your partner or your potential partner. It, it, it sets you up for success because you're basically saying, this is how we want to be in the relationship. This is how we want to communicate. This is how we want to share our lives. This is how we want to argue and disagree. People don't, that's another thing people don't make agreements about. So yeah. it leads to the next thing, agreements. Right, exactly. And, Got ba- to have and agreements. boundaries. B- big time. And that's a, that's a, that's a part, that's part of the agreements. Like, that's you're, right. you're share, if you're sharing yourself, hey, when I was young, my father really screamed a lot. And when I hear people screaming now, yeah, I've worked through it, I'm aware of it, but it can really activate a part of me. Now, I'm going to be responsible for that. I'm going to be responsible for how I react. I'm not going to be defensive or stonewall or shut down. But my request is, and a boundary for me is, please don't raise your voice That's if right. we're in argument. Let's, right. let's have, let's, if, we, if we see that escalating, let's spend 10 minutes away, then come back. Like These are agreements. These are boundaries. Yep. Like yep. You're sharing yourself, but you can only share yourself when you know yourself. You can only know yourself when you explore yourself. So important. So important. You know, it's, um, it's even something as simple as like name calling. Yeah. You know, Big we're, time. We're in some cultures... Yeah. It's I like grew up you, in that culture. If, if you if you're in England, for example, you everybody calls everybody a cunt, or 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 whatever the case may be, and if you don't know yourself and like something bothers you, right? It could be you know something as simple as for in one culture, right? In one culture, it's normal. It's normal to banter. It's normal to sure. to call each other names. And then in your culture, it's like, wait a minute. Do you even like me? Because in my <laughs> culture, we don't do that. That's right. Like that's a sign of like I hate you. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. So what's going on here? And then the other person has no idea because that's how they were raised, right? Until you, as the man, have the knowing of yourself to know and identify this doesn't feel good to me, and you're able to then voice what doesn't feel good and say, hey, you know. These are some boundaries that I would like for us to set. This is a definite no. We are not going to call each other names. You know, however uncomfortable that might feel in that moment, the woman will respond. And the woman, when she loves you, will appreciate that and will follow. And then vice versa. And then you get to do the same because I'm sure that she's going to have some things that she doesn't like or that maybe trigger her a little bit. And vice versa, she gets to do the same thing with you. Yeah, we get caught in these loops, man, where we become fearful of making requests and asking the people that we love for something that's important to us because we fear rejection or abandonment or humiliation. They, those are three core wounds and fears for men, generally speaking, for the human condition, but for men particularly, because we're so tied up. And, and this isn't an egoic thing. This is back to our evolutionary roots. We're so tied up in our utility. Like our our ability to provide, I don't just mean provide like a home and resources and food and all that, but our ability to provide value to the people that we care for, at at some point in our lifespans, uh, in, in our uh, human experience, meant life or death. Mm. Like our ability to do that well. That's in our nervous system still. That's why one of the reasons why men want to produce and create and do great things in the world is because we feel honor in that. So... That's a, that's a, that, that, so honor, courage, mastery, strength, the four uh, yeah, tenets yeah, yeah. there. Yeah. I knew it would come to me. Yeah. That honor piece is really, really important, right? And so in relationship, we get scared to ask because we, we fear that rejection, humiliation, abandonment as possibilities. But we are also generally, men are actually quite insecure because of our upbringings, not all men, of course. And so we compensate. And so we don't want to risk being told no. We don't want to, and we're also not shown how to ask. So we carry low self-worth. And and in that compensation, we either retract from the world and we hide and we don't ask for what I want, what we want, or we overpower and we over dominate and we're forceful and controlling in what we want. 
But that's not received well because that activates and triggers our partners in ways that makes them feel unsafe or they just feel, I shouldn't say makes them feel unsafe, they just feel unsafe because of those actions. Yeah. And so now we're caught in this, this web where we're both living from the shadow self, which is so unconscious that can't be touched in those moments and we're just causing friction and tension, which ultimately pulls the relationship apart. And so what could have been quite healing for us, because this is a really important point, our adult intimate relationships are extensions of and mirrors of our primary caregiver relationships. So Harville Hendricks, he says this very well. He says, and I'm maybe paraphrasing a little bit, our adult intimate relationships are both unconscious and conscious reflex, reflections of what we did and did not receive as children. And so we create these adult dynamics to help us heal something that feels very empty or very painful within us. But we often do this from an unconscious place, therefore we can't see it through. So my theory, if you like, is that many relationships end prematurely, prematurely being defined by the lessons and the wisdom that could have been gained, in other words, the growth and expansion for the individual is lost because the dynamic is so unconscious that they break up because we're arguing too much or we hate each other, where if we look deeper, if we take a few moments, we pause and we're more conscious about what's actually happening is that there are complementary wounds that are playing out in both part partners. And if they were to be different, than how they were when they were children with each other, deep healing would take place and deep opening would transpire, just like a medicine journey. That's, ex- that's exactly what it's like. That's exactly what it's like. We, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, back to your original question, we have to take steed of what's available to us in intimate relationship. It's not just about having someone there for convenience. And if that is the case, then we have to take a real look at ourselves. Where's that coming from? And, where, why, and why do you need that? Why do you need that? Yeah. Because what's underneath that is probably pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. Mm. It's pretty heavy. Yeah. You know, it was interesting um, when, when, when we broke up, when I broke up with my marriage. Um, I'm thinking back to when you said that you, you just spent time by yourself. Mm. That was my time. You mm-hmm. know, I had built this massive home and I was successful. And on the for the outside world, everybody thought like, man, this guy's got it all figured out, mm. you know. And and when I left, I went from that. Um, obviously, I wasn't going to, you know, I, I left her and the kids in the home. Um, yep, sorry, just pause for a moment. It's not obvious because some men wouldn't do that. I'm not saying that's the righteous thing or not. I don't want to judge that. But many yeah. men in anger and spite will fucking hurt their ex-partners and as a result, devastate their children because yeah. of their own ego and anger. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt, but just important point. I, I appreciate that. Thank mm. you. And I say obvious because I could never do that. Like I, mm. I just, I know. it's just not in me. Yeah. So, so I went and I, I, I was in this little apartment. You know, I was in this little apartment and I remember that, you know, part of my pain and, and part of the things that I used to use to, to mask my pain was I had built this massive bar in my house. Uh, Stefano, the bar was as big as oh, this. Oh, like an alcohol bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I had like the finest tequila in the world. Like, you know, it was my, my fucking ego was so big that like only my special friends could have the bottles at the top. It was like this big, stupid show, you know. And so anyways, back then tequila was like a big deal for me. You know, and I'd get drunk every single weekend. As I remember, I'm sitting there in this apartment and I'm now, you know, single. Mm. And my mind starts looking. This is not feeling good. You're Mm. all alone. You need to mask this pain. Go buy some tequila. Mm. And I had to make the cautious decision. No, Mm. I'm going to sit here. Mm. Go call a woman, you know, to go fuck, you know. No, I'm not going to do that. Go to New York, go visit your family. It was New Year's Eve or Christmas, you know, which to us is like a big deal. No, I'm not going to do that. And I remember one of my greatest breakthroughs was it was Christmas Eve. And I was all by myself with an Xbox, like a little kid, you know, like, like a teenager it. with a fucking Xbox. Sounds like a dream. Yeah, that's right, right? <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a, and a TV. And I realized, like, this is the first Christmas Eve in my life that I'm by myself. Mm. 
and I don't feel sorry for myself. Mm. Because that's the, what the ego wants to do. The ego wants to say, poor you, there's nobody around, there's no gifts, there's no big tree, there's no presence, there's no... And it's like in that moment, I started to detach from this paradigm that I had set up, right? Where I needed all of it, and I go, oh my God, I'm perfectly okay being with my, by myself, you know? And that was the journey, that was the beginning for me. It was hard. I spent many nights crying by myself, but it was that night that it was like there was a glimpse of hope for me because it, 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 I finally was okay with just being with me, you know? And if you're not okay with being with you, you'll never discover you. And if you never discover you, you'll never be okay with communi uh, communicating your truth in relationship to somebody else, which was my deepest fear mm. in my previous relationship. Mm. Question for you, did you, how many years ago was this? Four. Four, oh, four years ago, okay. Yeah. And then did you start experimenting with uh, psychotropic medicine after that? Yeah, it, so, so, yeah. So, so what happened was, you know Gerard Adams? Mm. Yeah, so what happened was my mom had just passed away. Mm. And so when my mom passed away, I felt the way she passed away was very unfair. Mm. And that started causing an unraveling in my mind that caused me to start asking some very deep questions mm. about God, about the universe, about all kinds of things. Mm. The number one question was, are you happy? And I had never had the courage to answer that truthfully. And, and that's when that started, right? And so I'm sitting in my little apartment, it's like New Year's, like 40 years ago or whatever, and I see Gerard and he's, he's happy and he's smiling. And I was like, you know, I know a lot of things about Gerard, but... The one thing I know, that's not his normal smile. Like there was something different about his smile. And so a month or two later, I, I hit him up and I go, hey, what was happening that New Year's Eve? Like you were, you had some, some weird like hippie face paint on your face. What was going on? He's like, dude, I did ayahuasca. And in that moment, mind you, I come from such a religious background that ayahuasca was the devil and evil, right? Mm -hmm. So for years, I was like, no, don't do that stuff, whatever. In that moment, I don't know what happened, but I said, sign me up. So it was that it was like literally two months after that New Year's Eve or, or that Christmas Eve mm. um, that everything started to happen. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because, and I'll, I'll tell you why, and I'll share a little bit of my journey around this as well. So I've, I've been deep into plant medicine for a number of years, um, but I did a, a tremendous amount of foundational work, inner work, in familiar states of consciousness before I went to something as mind-blowing and consciousness expanding as plant medicine, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of value in that. It's not the only way to do it, but there's a lot of value in that because it prepares you for the depth that a substance like ayahuasca, a medicine, a sacrament like ayahuasca can take you to, right? And I, and I, I want to point that out because too many men are too quick to go to let me go to this thing that's going to fix me or heal me or help me or sure. save me or whatever, right? Sure. Um, whereas sometimes we just need to sit with ourselves and do the things that are really, really difficult, do the things that we're not doing. So for you it was let me get rid of all the, the, the physical trophies that I've got that represent who I think represent who I actually am. Let me be in a small apartment. Let me not chase women. Let me not drink alcohol. Let me not conveniently go to my family and distract. Let me just be with myself, right? And there's great value in that. There's, there's you know, being a man of solitude, not loneliness, but solitude, deliberately spending time with self to know oneself, there's tremendous power in that. And, and that, just doing that in and of itself can very much create a healthy man. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. You know, in many ways, and, it, and it's so funny you bring that up because it was like my first three journeys, I couldn't sit on the mat. I was so afraid. So it's like in many ways, everything is perfect, but I sure. could have done even more work to prepare me sure. to lay there, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Because it took me a couple of journeys to finally be able to just lay yeah. there for four hours and just yeah. go in. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And, and look, it's all okay. It's all perfect. Yeah, there's, yeah. No, yeah. There's, no, there's no right or wrong, really. And there are ideals and not ideals. And those ideals and not ideals do uh, impact every individual differently. And... I am fairly certain that the more inner work that we can do in familiar states of consciousness, it creates a resilience 
within us. And, and in fact, I would even say it allows us to access greater depth when we're in those explosive peak experiences. I've had just on breath work alone, and breath work was very transformative for me. That's why I went to study it and teach it and what I do with it now. Breath work for me was like I was on a DMT experience. I, I mean, it changed my life, man. Yeah, yeah. It's just breath. Yeah. yeah. It's just breath. I know. I know. It's, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's to the point now that I'm not called, and I went in with mm. plant medicine. Mm. I'm not called back to it. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Cause now life has become the medicine. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. that experience with being held. Yeah. Like that was one of the oh, most profound. Or that experience with the ice bath at that weekend. Yeah. Remember that? Absolutely. That, well, you were held there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. As a result, as a result of that experience, you were deeply held. Yeah. Like deeply held by so many. Yeah. Right. And and, and that was medicine for so many others as well to be able to hold in that way. Yeah. And it's so interesting. You you said something. You said when I asked you, I just caught this when I asked you about what it means for a man to be in a healthy relationship with a woman, and you brought up, the first thing you brought up was, you gotta be held by men. Like, I met her and connected with her that very next weekend. So it's like, that would have not had happened. And wow. it, it would have not had happened had I not gone to that retreat. That's interesting. I just isn't caught it? that. Yeah, isn't that an interesting connection? Because huh? I would have fucked it up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. A hundred percent, I would have fucked it up. Yeah, and you still may fuck it up, but yeah. you won't fuck it up. Meaning, no. you'll be able to repair. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Because that's that's part of the relationship. I mean, there, there's so much healing in the repair. I'm not saying that we should, you know, purposely create conflict. This, but it's naturally just going to happen. It's life. Yeah. But the repair, if we can repair in in great alignment and in 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 healing ways, I mean, that's the, that's the expansion, man. Yeah, for sure, for sure. This was how, how long have we been talking? Five hours or what? <laughs> this is yeah. I don't even, really. I, it doesn't. It feels like you. So you think it's like five hours? Like you feel it's long? I, I feel, feel like, like it's shorter. I just feel like <laughs> deep. I yeah, feel like deep. But that's the know? whole point. Like the yeah. fact that we have different perception. I thought like, I got maybe a half an hour, forty minutes. I feel like we need to take the show on the road or something. <laughs> <laughs> <That'd> be fucking <laughs> epic. <laughs> how do they find you on Instagram or yeah? Yeah, I'm mainly on Instagram. Um, I'm on other social media channels, but at Stefanos Sefandos uh, and my website, stefanosefandos.com. Awesome. And we're yeah. definitely going to tag you and, you know, the whole thing. Of course. Thank you, man. Appreciate you, Thank man. you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. And this was another episode of The Higher Self. I don't know about you guys, but I learned a lot. I A lot was revealed to me. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, give it the thumbs up or the stars or the comments or whatever the case may be. And, and you know what? And share this one because I'll tell you what, I think that there's a lot of men out there who, who need this, who need this conversation. And, um, you know, when you help heal a man, right, you help heal the masculine within you. The same way that when we as men hold space for our women, we help heal the feminine within ourselves. Because what we're really truly doing is healing those energies in the world, in the universe. So share it with somebody that you love and we'll see you next week. Hey friends, thanks for watching this week's episode of The Higher Self. I wanna invite you to go to dannymorell.com to get inside access to all of our programs and our upcoming events. And I look forward to seeing you live in person at one of our next events.